these two got stuck when they were being born and so they uh had a hard hard start and their mom wasn't capable of taking care of him he's getting it youtube friends this is robert this Hi. is jeremiah's brother they're here for spring break essentially came to visit and so he he and i were just sitting here and i was catching him up on all the goat drama in the goat yard and all our bottle babies which we have recently acquired but hey i would rather these guys be alive taking bottles than the alternative of not being alive miss mercy and mr mac and they are ready for dinner jeremiah just went to get it Are you a goat dad no. Look at your beautiful goat kid. <laughs> They're sucking on your pinky. Yeah. Ben said, I'm too young to be an uncle. I'm too young. To be an uncle. <laughs> Did you know that? Did you know Uncle Noah was younger than you when he became an uncle? It's true. Ew, how old is he? He was like a year old. Yeah. Have you picked up that kid that Dot had, that little doling? She is mm -hmm. massive. No, I haven't picked it up. You should pick that kid up. Good evening, you guys. So the last vlog that I posted, I kind of cut off because it had gotten a little long and I'm starting again in the same evening, picking up where I left off. We have just made the decision to go ahead and keep Adele's kids as bottle babies. And I'm milking her and her milk will come in probably tomorrow. She's still colostrum, but Dot also kitted this morning and she's a really heavy producer and She just had a single kid. So I'm milking some from Dot as well uh, Just to bring her milk in strong and to make sure that I have enough colostrum for these twins So I'm not completely emptying her out because she still does have her kid on her, but I am taking some milk from her to feed these other babies. If you ever have a goat, have a single kid. If you ever have a goat, have a single kid. Sometimes what will happen is the kid will favor one side and your goat's udder will be really lopsided. So even though you might not start milking regularly, like withholding the, the kid at night and milking in the morning um, until the kid is two weeks old, a lot of times if you have a singleton, you wanna start milking at least once a day anyway and just emptying out any lopsidedness so the milk comes in steady on both sides. If you end up with a goat with a lopsided udder because you have a kid favoring one side, it can get better the next time they kid. Like you can kind of milk, bring the milk back in but sometimes it won't come back in. And sometimes the next time they kid, you'll notice even still that it's just a little bit lopsided. Uh, not too bad, but, but that can linger. That's how Nestle is. She has a lopsided udder because her first time she kidded, she had a single baby who would only eat from one side. So I put Adele's kids back in with her and I was just hoping that maybe she would start letting them eat because she's licking on them and she's loving on them, but every time they latch, she kicks them off and steps on them and stands on them, which really stinks. Which we discussed this in the last vlog about making this decision. Um, one thing that if you are going to acquire a goat, a dairy goat for your farm that you should ask and I have not always asked this but I've really learned to start asking this is ask what this doe's history is in raising kids like has she raised kids before and that way you have at least this expectation because like right now she had kids she had beautiful healthy kids she has a beautiful udder she stands great for milking and what I'm assuming has happened in her past is that she probably has not raised her kids either she wouldn't take care of them or they were pulled because a lot of goat keepers pull kids at birth and bottle feed them and my assumption here is that she really just is freaked out and doesn't really know what's going on but i could be wrong there could be something that i don't understand happening here but i'm gonna be bottle feeding these kids or i guess i should say my kids are gonna be bottle feeding you got miss mercy eating her bottle did you feed matt his bottle Good deal. He's like, mm. <laughs> you got it, little boy? Look at that little round belly. <laughs> you cute. Guys, y'all recognize this? It's a golden hour farm walk. Hey, girls. Hey, girls. Oh, y'all see the empty high tunnel? Well, I'm getting it filled back up. These cauliflowers are sure taking off. And I've got some 
red cabbages and my leeks are looking really lovely. I was noticing that my Chinese cabbages I put in here, some of them have grown a lot, but one got eaten by some sort of pest. I've got some different lettuce seeds coming up here, some random beets and carrots that kind of got washed down here and I'm just letting them grow. <laughs> Come on, buddy. Come on, you sweet boy. Y'all check out Compost Mountain back here. That's pretty wild, huh? For reference, this pile is about as tall as I am. <laughs> it's a really big pile of stuff. That's uh, plants that are pulled out. Mostly it's just bedding from the animals. Now we are not super technical composters. <laughs> uh, basically what we have always done is just piled up all our bedding. Uh, the spent plants that weren't sick that we didn't feed our animals. We feed most of our spent plants to our animals. And we've just piled them up and we usually just leave it, turn it with the tractor every, I don't know, month or two. And then it's usually ready to go on the garden, at least within the next year. So obviously not super technical, but at the scale we're doing it, that's always worked for us. I aspire someday to have a much more methodical setup. Um, I love Charles Dowding's compost setup where he's extremely meticulous in getting things turned over in a timely manner and he makes compost a lot faster. So I would really like to do that someday, we just never have. Check out all the dinosaur kale that went to sea. The warm weather came and just caused this to sprout. It had a good run. Me and Nana planted this last, um, gosh, when was that? August, July? Hey pigs. Hey pigs, hey big pigs. Pigs versus geese. The war of the farm. Oh, do you need some too? <laughs> the pigs are like, come at me bro. <laughs> Does anyone totally just add narration to all their animal endeavors in their life? I know that's not just me. Cause I totally do it. Like, anytime any animal is doing anything, I'm like totally writing a script for it. I'm gonna try to feed the geese, but I have a feeling they're not gonna get very much of this. I feel like someone may ask, if this is still edible for us. Like, why am I feeding all this to animals? And you could probably still eat it, like. It's not great. I'm trying, guys, I'm trying to help you. <laughs> These pigs are so big. So some plants, their chemical makeup actually changes when they go to seed and they become bitter, like a lot of lettuces and basils. Uh, they get like a, just a bitter taste to them or kind of like a soapy taste to them. And basically what that plant is doing is it's fending off the things that might come and keep its seed from spreading. Now it's really fascinating because you've got fruit bearing plants, which are things that make fruit, which a fruit is the ovary of a plant. So it's the things that hold the seeds, like a tomato or a pepper or a melon. All of those are considered fruit, squash, any of that. And those, the method that the plant spreads its seed is by becoming tasty. And it wants to bring things to it um, because it wants to be eaten. It wants the fruit to be eaten. And that's why so many of those seeds that are encased in a fruit, a tasty fruit that lures things to eat it, like us, uh, those are encased in like a gel. And the reason why is because those seeds are actually covered so that they can live through a digestive tract and make it through to the other end where they can be planted. Which is why at the end of a season, like all of our animal yards are completely full of tomatoes and squash and cucumbers and all of that stuff because vegetables, what we call vegetables, really when we're talking about eating vegetables, we're just talking about eating a part of a plant. We're talking about eating a stem or a leaf or a root. Uh, they actually do the opposite. Like once they get to the point that they're putting their seeds off, they are trying to become less tasty. But with things like this kale, you can see the flower pods. now. Kale actually does produce pods. And a lot of things do. They'll produce like a tall stem and it'll have a pod. It kind of looks like a, 
a little green bean when it dries up and you just pop it open and the seeds are inside and you can eat those pods a lot of leafy plants they don't produce pods they actually just produce flowers and the flowers dry up and the seeds are in the flowers and a lot of things when they get to the point of seeding they are going to be tough they're going to not be as tasty they're not as tender that's because the plants that do that the plants that change flavor they're not trying to attract something to come eat them to spread their seed they're actually trying to deter things from eating them while they try to spread their seed because usually those things have a different type of seeds like a lot of the leafy things the basils and the uh the lettuces and the flowery type stuff their seeds are so fine that they're just going to blow on the wind and so they don't actually need you to digest them now kale actually it grows a pod it grows a tall center stalk and pods on it and they actually taste pretty good radishes grow pods on the stalks whenever they're developing their seeds it tastes just like radishes so if you have a hard time growing radishes in a warm weather place just let them go to seed and eat their pods they're really good in stir fries and on salads now i think this stuff is so fascinating obviously i could talk about it for a long time but one of the main questions that I get asked by new gardeners is, well, how do I save seeds for a carrot? How do I save seeds for kale? How do I save seeds for these things? And it's a very confusing thing for people who are new. And they always say, I'm sorry, this is a stupid question, which there aren't any stupid questions. I mean, why would you know that if you've never grown a garden? Why would you know that if nobody's ever taught you? There's nothing wrong with not knowing things. It's really good to ask about the things that you don't know. And the bottom line is this, if you're new to gardening, if you cannot see where something keeps its seeds, you just need to wait longer. Like, uh, it's gonna become obvious. Once the seeds are ready, they're easy to find. In most cases, in all cases that I can think of, maybe somebody can, can, can give me an example of where I'm wrong on that. But in most cases, if the seeds are ready and they're, they're ready to save, they're ready to grow, you can find them. And if you can't find them, if you absolutely don't know where the seeds are, you just need to wait longer. <laughs> the reason why this kale is not great to eat right now is not because it tastes bad. It's because it's really tough. Because in the case of a lot of things that we call vegetables, like roots and leaves, they're just much better when they're young and tender. There you go. Oh look, the geese and the ducks finally got some, some leaves. And that's basically a rule that applies to just about any food that you would want to grow. Um, typically things that are harvested younger are going to be softer. Uh, with root vegetables, when you leave them in the ground a really long time, they're going to get kind of pithy or hard. Now you can still eat them and they're still good for certain things, but you might want to use them differently just with that toughness in mind. And the thing with like those kales, the older kales, you can still eat them. But typically if I'm gonna harvest older kale, which is what I have right now, almost all my kale is older. Most of it has not bolted. That dinosaur kale was planted months before the other stuff. But I just use that stuff in things like soups. I'm definitely cooking it. I'm not wanting to eat any of that raw. If I'm gonna eat raw kale, I want it to be younger which actually I'll show you here. You can kind of see that we've been breaking the rules and harvesting more from the tops of these plants because these top leaves are still tender, whereas the bottom ones are getting pretty tough. Um, and I mean, we've harvested a lot off the bottoms, but the older the leaves, the tougher they're gonna be. You can even tell the difference in the colors here. These are also gonna be bolting soon. I pulled, I pulled a flower pot off of this one the other day which is why I'm replanting kale for spring. I've got some, actually some little starts right here that I'm putting in so we can have another wave of it. And I'll, and we will grow leafy things until it gets too warm to do it. Uh, then they'll all go to seed and I'll feed them to the animals and start another round for fall. Do y'all see my onions and my garlic looking good? I know they don't show up just a whole lot, but look at the elephant garlic, isn't that lovely? Do y'all remember the day we planted that? It's so cool. I love watching things grow. So back here is the area that's been prepared by animals and it is weed free. So we're gonna get a layer of mulch down on that as well as a layer down over here. And this is actually where I'm gonna be planting potatoes and potentially sweet potatoes as well. I should probably have that figured out by now, <laughs> considering I need to put them in the ground like in a week. Potatoes, not sweet potatoes. I'm going to be planting sweet potatoes for a little while. Check this out, guys. 
this is what chickens can do. Just after having chickens here and just having some straw down, there's grass growing. So my dad actually had our tractor and I haven't really been thinking about putting the potatoes in until we got our tractor back. And then I was like, oh wow, I think it's about time to do that. You kind of typically want to plant your potatoes. You can plant them as early as like three or four weeks before your last frost date. Uh, they are semi frost hardy. They can't take like a really hard freeze, but if they're coming up out of the ground and it's a little frosty in the mornings, it's not gonna hurt them. Uh, I would definitely keep an eye on your 10 day forecast. And if you have like really extreme freezes or a bunch of winter weather coming your way, definitely wouldn't put them in even if it is three or four weeks before your last frost date. Most likely though, if you're three or four weeks out, your evenings are warming up and your days are warming up and it's probably fine. Potatoes, they only take like four months or so to come to maturity. So however you're planting them, if you're planting them like in grow bags or a kiddie pool or in the ground, I use kind of like a modified root stout method, mounding up straw, which I'll show you guys this whenever we do plant these here in the next couple weeks. Actually, I grow two rounds of potatoes, plant them at the end of March and dig them at the beginning of July. So they take like three and a half months, I guess, like 12 to 14 weeks, I think is on average. And then repl I replant them at that time and then dig them again at the end of October when it's about to freeze. I just dig them before the freeze. And they're not as big the second round, but we got a pretty nice second harvest of potatoes last year by replanting some of the potatoes we still had left over that had, had seeded. I'll go into details on that on a separate video, but I did kind of want to put it on your radar. Uh, keep in mind, potatoes are something that you typically are going to put in before your last frost comes. And it's something nice to be able to do while you're waiting to be able to put your like tomatoes and squashes and melons and all that stuff in the ground. You can go ahead and start planting potatoes. So it is getting dark. I am being summoned inside. Sweet Maya cooked dinner tonight like a little angel so that I could be out here with you guys. <laughs> I cannot believe that it's like 70 degrees and it's like 6.45. The time change actually kind of kicked my butt this time uh, just because I'm so like swinging into the routine of spring and it's all kind of up in the air, but I'm getting adjusted and I'm just so glad that the garden's coming back. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I bless you until next time.